203, and if you'll stand up, we'll sing these songs, and uh, uh, as soon as we get done with the song service, we'll have the uh, Super Bowl on the big screen up here. <laughs> Not really. So if you're going to watch it, you better go home. The windows of heaven are open, the blessings are falling tonight. There's joy, joy, joy in my heart since Jesus made everything right. I gave him my old tattered garment, he gave me a robe of pure white. I'm feasting on why I'm happy to not speed up a little bit. The windows of heaven are open. The blessings are falling tonight. There's joy, joy, joy in my heart since Jesus made everything right. I gave him my old tattered garment. He gave me a robe of pure white. I'm feasting on my Time. That's why I'm happy tonight. The windows open. There's joy, joy, joy in my heart since Jesus made everything right. I gave him my old tattered garment. He gave me a robe of pure white. I'm feasting on. Hey, 194, it's a song called Since Jesus Came Into My Heart. What a wonderful change in my life has been wrought since Jesus came into my heart. I have light in my soul for which long I had sought since Jesus came into my heart. The sea billows roll since Jesus came into my heart. I have ceased from my wandering and going astray since Jesus came into my heart. And my sins, which were many, are all washed away since Jesus came into my heart. y'all are going to keep going. Oh, my goodness. Hey, listen, to be here is something to be thankful for. I, uh, Our church clerk did me such a wonderful job of getting the information that I requested just this morning. Actually, the church 
was founded February the 21st, 1993. This is the notes of our first church clerk, who was not the clerk at the time because we hadn't voted on anything happening or happening. So it says, today was a very special, or very special, truly a blessed event. Our church was reborn again. Uh, Brother Dennis is our pastor again, and our church family reunited. The Lord has truly blessed us, and this was the first organized meeting. We'd had one meeting before that with, I think, 18 people, but that day there were 47 people there. So uh been a long time. Been a good time. Amen. Seventeen. Yeah, we were in that building three and a half years thereabouts. Yeah, before we came here, uh, that was the building that we had a, a real several real spiritual services in. One was exp extremely spiritual, while and right in the middle of the service, uh, I happened to look out, and people over here were getting all up and going around. I thought, goodness, what? Man, we about, and all of a sudden, I realized what was happening. There was a rat that ran out. That wasn't so bad. There was a snake chasing him. And actually, um, the snake caught the, the rat in the church, and the women were having a fit. And, and I'm thinking, well, hey, let's leave them alone. I mean, let's, it got more excitement there than most times, so <laughs> it, was, it was different. And you could actually, I actually remember preaching, and it was really windy outside one, one Sunday, and I had laid my Bible open, and this is the truth. The wind was blowing so hard it turned the pages in my Bible through the walls. <laughs> it had no insulation in it, and you could see outside, it's like I said before, you could actually throw a cat through the wall and not hurt the wall or the cat <laughs> so it was it, but it was a blessed place and it was just we had um, I had as most of you know I'd, I was there had pastored a church for six years and uh, felt the Lord was just have you ever well if you if you ever been to a place you knew God was through with you wherever if you were just at a church and and that was the time that I had walked started out of the out of my house in the garage one Sunday morning, and God said, this is the last service you'll preach at this church. Okay, Lord. And so it was. Um, left there, and for the next year, we were involved in prison ministry, which is, a, is one of the loves, great loves of my life. And uh, to make another long story short, God said, no, that's not what I called you to do. Get back to doing this, and this is where we started. And by the way, Pam, his grandmother, uh, was the one that let us use the building. And the building had been vacant for about three years. That's why the snakes and the rats. And there was a piano there. There were two pianos, I think, two or three. We had to get rid of some of them. And, uh, and they would hide in the piano. Of course, Angel was the pianist. So <laughs> you can imagine how she must have felt. <laughs> but anyway, good memories. And uh, if you miss being there, uh, it's like the old, the old boy used to say, you'll never understand it unless you were there. Gene? <laughs> those pews must have been built that they were in the church when we got there and they they were honestly i did a lot of praying over those pews because the pews were packed because the church wasn't very big it was a fourth that was less than a fourth this size it's over here on the corner of um getty road and highway 90 there that little building there and uh, but anyway it and one end of the pew gave in, and here they went sliding down. And I said, well, at least we're going to meet in the middle, right? <laughs> Ms. Joyner? Absolutely. Sure is the world. Amen. It's been, a, it's been a great 21 years. I'm looking for 21 more. What about y'all? Y'all don't sound too excited. Let me say that again. I'm looking for 20 more. <laughs> hey, uh, when I say 21 more, I mean here, there, or in the air, wherever he wants to be. Amen. That'll work. But anyway, remember to pray for each other. Pray for our, a lot of our church family tonight. I have ball game itis. And uh, maybe they'll get over it after one of, their, one of their, I can tell you, I could have saved a lot of you people a lot of trouble. If you want to know who's going to win, just ask me. The one with the most points. 
That's it. And, and it doesn't matter. There are going to be some mad people tonight. There are going to be some glad people tonight. And you know what? I've even had people to ask me to pray over ball games. <laughs> and I have to tell them I don't believe God's in the ball games. So y'all go ahead. Nothing wrong with y'all wanting ball, ball games or watching them. There's nothing wrong. But anyway, I got to hurry because somebody told me the kickoff was at 625. I need to tell you, you ain't going to be at the kickoff. <laughs> I said, okay. All right, let's relax and enjoy the Lord, and we're going to ask our men to come and receive the offering tonight, and we'll get right on into the rest of the service, all right? By the way, don't forget, next Sunday night at this time, we'll be doing our ordination services for our deacons and elders, so be sure to try to be here in attendance if you can, and, uh, and we'd appreciate that. Brother Mark, pray for us, friend. It's good to be back in the book of John. John chapter 11, let's... Wander over there and see what the Lord is going to let us find tonight that will glorify Him and encourage us and help strengthen us in the Lord. When we get to chapter 11 in the book of John, the Gospel of John, we'll see 90% of the public ministry of Jesus will have ceased. It begins here to a time when Jesus sort of withdraws Himself and starts spending a lot of time with His disciples. And by the way, it's just a few days now until He'll be crucified a time when they're, they'll be leaving shortly to go up to the Passover, which were, is where Jesus will eventually make his last appearance, earthly appearance, at this point in time. And in chapter 11, this, prob this is the greatest miracle, in my opinion, that Christ ever did. Um, and I asked you guys a question when we were, last when we were going to approach this. How many remember the question that I asked you to research and see if you could find an answer? Anybody? Miss Young, tell us what it was. Uh, okay, well, you tell us what it was. <laughs> Honey, you think slower than anybody does. Go ahead. But I love you anyway. Can you remember? I'm sorry? Right. Remember, I asked you that because he was bound hand and foot, how he got out to, out of the grave. And, of course, you know, we could, a simple answer would be because God told him to come out, right? I did find one author that made a statement that, uh, and, and, and I have a tremendous amount of respect for the author, but uh, the reason he makes, and, and it's, it's a truism, but I don't believe it's necessary. He's, he said that, of course, and I knew this, that the Egyptians, um, actually, when they buried their dead, they wrapped them extremely tight, like a mummy form. And, of course, covered their head. But the Jews didn't do that. They actually layered uh, wrapping loosely. And then, of course, in between every, every layer, they were perfumed to stop the, the stench, uh, at least for a minimal time. Because at that point in time, they didn't do an embalming. In fact, the only time that I know that embalming is mentioned in the Scripture was Joseph. When they embalmed Joseph, because he was going to be kept, his body was going to be kept quite a time for them. He said, don't forget, when y'all leave here, don't you leave my bones in this place. Take me out of here, wherever you're going to the promised land. But I believe that he came out, how can I say this, miraculously. Now, why do I believe that? Well, you'll find out, why would Jesus tell them to loose him if he was already loose, where he could walk around? He, wouldn't, he could unloose himself. But so I uh, and I I'm sorry, Doctor So and So. I will I I appreciated their input, and it may have some merit. But since I'm doing the preaching tonight, we're going to say he came out miraculously. How's that? Okay. And if you find something different, I, it, it's not a theological point. It's just a point of encouragement to me because my God is still supernatural. Amen. You know we're we're we find ourselves looking at something like this, which is. By the way, it's sort of a, a end of a, uh, the, the stories of, his, of all of his. This is the seventh miraculous sign that we found already in the book of John. And one of the last ones that we'll find where Jesus actually did miracles um, with other people or on other people. Of course, the greatest miracle we'll find is the miracle of his death and resurrection and that he's still alive today. But in chapter 11, verse 1, let's just begin and read a few verses. And then we'll stop and make some comments about it. And, of course, remember, the last few verses, if you want to get the end of Jesus' public ministry, if you want to read the last couple of verses of chapter 10, that's more or less a climax when it says, in, and uh, 
In verse 39, therefore they sought in chapter 10, therefore they sought again to take him, but he escaped out of their hand and went away again beyond Jordan. Now he's moving out of the direct impact of the Jewish uh, population for his own protection because it's not his time, of course, uh, into the place where John at, fir- at first baptized, and there he abode. And many resorted unto him and said, John did no miracle, but all things that John spake of this man were true, and many believed on him there. Public ministry beginning to close, as we said. Chapter 11 is going to be um, sort of a, an entranceway, a doorway of that which is to come. And I believe that the resurrection of Lazarus, uh, re- certainly Lazarus, we know this historically, was a, was a valid person. He had uh, two sisters of Mary and Martha. They're going to be introduced for the first time in this gospel now. And so we're going to see real people that really get sick and die and yet are resurrected again. Isn't that an amazing thing? Just to think about that blows my mind. But here in chapter 11, verse 1, let's begin reading where it says, Now a certain man was sick named Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. Apparently, from what we can gather, these three uh, uh, brothers and sisters together probably lived together and were part of a, a fairly prominent family from what research I could find. And one of the reasons is we're going to find that the way that the morning, the morning of the death of this young man uh, apparently was fairly young. That'll uh, give you an insight of the, to their to their prominence, and it, we'll show you when we get there. And here's a parenthetical statement now in verse two: It was that Mary which anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Sometimes, how many know? Sometimes, when you're reading the scriptures, you find so many Marys, it's hard to keep up with. And by the way, that was a very prevalent name during those days. It's kind of like Linda now. How many Lindas are in this church? You say Linda and half the church stands up. Uh, it was a very prevalent name. And, it, and, of course, you do know also that Jesus was a very public, public name, a very prominent name. Uh, a lot of people were named that. But no one was named Jesus of Nazareth but one. And his name, of course. Someone, how many, someone has ever asked me recently, what was Jesus' last name? He did have a last name, by the way. Um, and it was actually he was named after Joseph's uh, lineage because he was of that particular lineage, but he was not Joseph's son, even though he does have a, quote, historical last name. And I read it, but I can't remember what it was. But anyway, it says it tells us who these people were and that this they were all uh, brothers and sisters and that Lazarus was the brother of this Mary who is going to and is already anointed in other in other part of the gospel where she anointed Jesus' feet. Uh, when when he came to into their home. Verse 3 says, Therefore his sisters sent unto him, unto Jesus, saying, Lord, behold, uh, listen to this word, he whom thou lovest is sick. Now, it's amazing how many people are doing all they can to pervert this book. You do know that, don't you? How many know that he, Jesus has been typed as being a, homo- being, being a homosexual? He's been typed as having, uh, having a wife and duplicate different wives and it takes just a little bit of some say claim try to prove that when these words were used where jesus he said that one that you loved is sick they tried to make this a a an affair and it's amazing how sick people have got to be in their mind but god's word will always stand the word that's used here in in verse three is the word phileo it's not, it's not eros. It's not the word that's used in an intimate relationship. It's a friendship word. He loved Lazarus as his friend, not as an erotic lover, not even as an agape. This is not the word that's used here. It's the word phileo. So Jesus loved Lazarus because he was his friend. Let me ask you a question, ladies and gentlemen. What's wrong with one man loving another man like his friend? Or a woman loving another woman like her friend. And today they, we try to make it, uh, we don't, but many of the people that are trying to discredit Jesus and other believers are doing anything they can to try to cloud the issue. Just a sidebar, didn't cost anything, but looking it up. Now, I do find that word agape used in, in two verses down. But I look at verse 4. When Jesus heard that, that Lazarus was sick, he said, 
This sickness is not unto death. Now, hold on a minute. We know he's going to die. In fact, I, I believe that we can prove in all probability that when the mess by the time the messenger got there, probably Lazarus was already dead. There's a good possibility because where Lazarus where Lazarus' home was in Jerusalem to where Jesus and the disciples were, from what I can determine by looking at the map, it's probably about a day's journey. So it took the messenger, they was back before AT and T and any of those things. You couldn't call anybody, so he had to had to actually it was a runner that would take the message to Christ. So it would have took him about a day to get there. And it would have taken him, Jesus, another day to get back. And so Jesus says we're going to wait two days uh, before, before they went. So let's read the word now when it says, When Jesus heard that, he said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God. He said, This young man is not dying out of a, a natural reason. He's dying for the glory of God so that God will be glorified. He was sick. His sickness and his death was for the glory of God. So he says that the Son of Man might be glorified thereby. Jesus was saying uh, whenever uh, he was giving literally testimony of what was going to happen, is this man was dying so that Jesus could go and resurrect him, so that he, the Lord Jesus Christ, would get the glory for something that no one had ever seen anything done. Now, you do remember that there was some resurrections uh, before this in the book of John. Remember Lazarus' daughter? She was resurrected. But all of those uh, were resurrected right after their death. You know, within just minutes or hours of their death. This man, will find, body was already decomposing. As it was, had been, remember what they said? Uh-oh, let's don't open the grave because now he stinketh. Remember? So we know that his body was already beginning to decompose. And so anyway, when we pick it up, he says that this happens for the glory of God. And sometimes, I remember how many times you remember, I remember at least one other time, remember the man that was born blind, and, uh, and, they, and his disciples asked him, well, what in the world is wrong with this guy here? I mean, who sinned, he or his mother, or his parents? And, of course, Jesus said, neither sinned. This, this blindness is for the glory of God. And so, again, we see the, uh, see the hand of God. And remember this. God is interesting in bringing him glory to himself and his son and the Godhead for one reason, not, not because he's, he's prideful or arrogant, but because the only way that we can understand how big God is is sometimes see how big God is when he works in some of the miracle works that he does. So in verse 5, it said, Now Jesus loved Martha. Now there's the word agape. It's not the word eros, it's not the word phileo, it's the word agape. He loved her like God loves his children. And he loved Martha and her, and her sister and Lazarus. So that's Martha, Mary, and Lazarus. Now, loved Lazarus as a man loves his God. He's loved like God loves his, like loves his children. And in verse 6, and said, When he had heard, therefore, that he was sick, Jesus, he abode two days still in the same place where he was. Now, you can imagine that whenever he got the message, I, I believe this, and here's another one of those miraculous things. I believe he knew then that Lazarus was dead. I, of course, he knows all things. What, do I, what am I saying that for? He knows, he knows yesterday. He knows tomorrow. He has, he's, he's omniscient. He's omnipresent. He has, a, he, he, has, he has all the power. He knows everything at the same time. It's hard for us to get a hold of that. But I believe at that point in time, he knew that already. And he said, here's what we're going to do. We're going to wait two days. And they awaited two days in the same place. In verse 7, then after that, saith he to his disciples, let us go into Judea again. Now, I read behind an author said, well, the reason they were waiting two days, they were waiting for it uh, so the Jews would forget too much about Jesus so they wouldn't be looking for him and would kill him when he came in. I got news for you. They couldn't have killed Jesus if they'd have walked up face to face with him. It wasn't time for him to die. That is not going to happen until God was ready for him to be glorified. But now he's ready to go back into Judea. And so the Bible said in verse 8, His disciples saith unto him, Master, the Jews of late sought to stone thee, and goest thou thither again? These guys had a lot of faith, didn't they? Do you do realize that when his disciples walked with him, they did not have the aid that you and I have. They didn't have the inner testimony of the Spirit of God living within them. And they were human like you and I 
were before we met the Lord. They were sinners, not yet saved by grace, still walking with Christ. And so did they believe in Christ? Yes, they did. Did they walk with Christ? Yes, they did. But again, they didn't have what you and I have, God living in us, until the Spirit of God descended and then up begins to abide in every believer. So they said, Lord, you remember they were out to kill you up there. We might better hold off for a while, which would be a, a common thing to say. And Jesus answered in verse 9, Are there not twelve hours in the day? He said, Guys, look, it, it can be daylight or it can be dark, but there's twelve hours in the day. And he said, If any man walk in the day, he's using a euphemism here. He said, He stumbleth not. Because he seeth the light of this world, but if a man walk in the night, he stumbleth because there is no light in him. Jesus was saying, there's a time for me to walk. My ministry is being fulfilled. I'm going to fulfill this ministry. I'm going in the day because I'm, I'm going under the, under the light of my Father. I'm doing the will of my Father, and I am not going to wait longer than I should because then I'll have to walk in darkness. The darkness would be out of the will of God. And so he's not going to do that, and he's explaining that to them. I have no fear of going back to Judea. I have no fear of being stoned by, by the Jews simply because it's not my time yet. By the way, you do know that Passover is just around the corner. Well, Passover is going to be the time our Lord uh, actually was crucified, was, was, was nailed to the cross. And so he knew that his time was not yet, and he was letting them understand that, you know, I, there's... If there's no light, I'm not going to walk in that. I'm going to be walking during this time. I'm going to be in the will of my Father doing what he said. So he waited two days. Then the Bible says in verse 11, These things said he, and after that he said unto them, Our friend Lazarus, what? Now remember, again, I made this statement to you earlier in the Scriptures, that always when you see the death of a Christian, or primarily believers, you might find it of others, primarily believers, it's never mentioned as death, it mentioned as sleeping. And he said, our friend Lazarus sleeping. Now, his disciples didn't understand that. Listen to the verbiage. And he said, our friend Lazarus sleepeth, but I go that I may awake him out of sleep. Now, it wasn't Lazarus taking a nap, right? He's got to walk. He and the disciples have to walk. If they'd have just thought about this, they had to walk a day to get there. And so was Jesus saying, hey, Lazarus is sleeping, so I'm going to walk up there and wake him up. We know that that wasn't, that wasn't. We know that, but we wonder sometimes, did they really get it when he said that? Did they, did they understand? Well, apparently not. They did not believe at that point in time that Lazarus was dead. Goes listen to their statement. Then said Thomas, doubting Thomas, which is called Didymus, unto his fellow disciples. Didn't say it to Jesus, said to them. He said, let us also go that we may die with him. That could be taken two ways. That could be taken, well, you know, we have such an allegiance to him. Uh, and if they're going to kill him, let's go and let him, let him kill us also. And we know that Thomas didn't have that kind of faith later, did he? He didn't have that, that faith of trusting God then. So maybe, maybe he was implying that, um, you know, we, we just, we're going to die anyway. Let's just go ahead and get it over with. I, that may be the possibility of what he meant there. But he said, let's just go and, and, uh, and we'll die with him, speaking of Christ. Then in verse 17, then, then when Jesus came, he found that he had laid in the grave. How long? Four days. Okay, now think a minute. Jesus knew, as we know, that the body begins to decompose earlier than that. Even with the, with the wrapping and the perfume, usually they say two and a half to three days, de decomposition happens. That's why the embalming is done. Basically, it takes the blood out of the body, and they can preserve the body in a, in a, in a longer time. But here is four days, and they know he's been dead for four days. He's been laying in the grave for four days. And the Bible says in verse 18, Now Bethany was nigh unto Jerusalem about 15 furlongs. So they, it would, as I said, it would take them just about a day to get there. And many of the Jews came to Martha and, and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. Now, the reason that this is important, it gives you some idea of what, uh, how the family was, is they had a lot of the Jews came. Now, it was, I read something uh, that I did not know until just recently, um, that there had to be a, there had to be, people that had to have at least two flute players 
sister, you'd be interested in that. At every morning service, every, they had to hire two flute players and one lady mourner. No matter how poor you were, a Jewish tradition was that you had, that's what you had to have when you had a funeral. When someone died, that was the, that was the popular way. But it appears that many Jews came, so apparently this was a notable family. It did not just three came, but many of the Jews came to Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. Then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him. But Mary sat still in the house. I wonder if Mary was preoccupied at that particular moment. Remember, she's the one that was so sensitive to Jesus she was the one that was sitting at his feet while Martha was busy uh, trying to get dinner for him. And she wanted Jesus to tell Mary, come in here and help me get food for these guys. And Jesus said, listen, Martha, you're encumbered by so many things. But I want you to know that this man uh, has got something and Mary has found the best thing. And so she was, she was being corrected. Martha was and Mary was being encouraged. And now Mary is sitting still for whatever purpose, and then, verse 21, Then said Martha unto Jesus, Lord, if thou hast been here, my brother had not died. You know, I used to read this verse and think that that was critical of Martha, that she was being critical. I don't believe that now. I went back and looked at some of the Greek verbiage, and here's what I believe. I believe she was expressing the fact that no one could die in the presence of Jesus. I believe her faith was that strong. Maybe she learned something in the kitchen. You think? Maybe she got a hold of something that, that made it better for her because it doesn't seem, and again, if you read that, it's, it's, it wasn't questionable. It wasn't argumentative. It seemed to be is that I know you have the power to heal him. You had the power to keep him from dying. And he said, my brother would not have died. But, verse 22, I know that even now, Whatsoever thou wilt ask of God, God will give it thee. That verse, it kind of buffers my thinking about what I believe that she really believed about this Jesus. I believe that she, her walk had closed up. I believe there was a, a deeper understanding of what she had gone through uh, with, with seeing some of the other things and then losing her brother. And then Jesus said in verse 23, he says, Thy brother shall rise again. And that seems like a normal statement, especially to a believer. And I would have probably thought, just like Martha thought, and Martha said unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. And, and Jesus said, well, wait a minute, Martha. That you, you got some things confused. Resurrection isn't a day. Resurrection is a person. Got it? It's a person. And then he explains it. Here's what he says. Jesus said unto her, Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Then he makes this statement, And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never what? Believest thou this? Now, you've got to think, he said, wait a minute. Uh, Lazarus believed in you. But he died <laughs> only physically. He was still alive spiritually. Do you get what I'm saying here? Even though his body, it's going to happen to us. Our bodies are going to die, but the Spirit's not. It's just waiting for God to call us home. Amen? And this is a perfect picture of what's going to happen to every true believer unless the rapture occurs. And I'm, I'm still praying for, I'm looking for a hole in the sky, not in the ground, aren't y'all? I told, I told Brother Scott Whitehead, I said, I hope the rapture comes and puts all you funeral directors out of business and he said amen brother i'll take that and we'll go home together the idea here is that he says that person that believes in me and look what he said he says though whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die believest thou this again he was testing where she was he knew already he wanted her to know and she said unto him yea lord i believe that thou art the christ the son does this sound familiar I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. Remember how he was asking, what do men say that, who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And the one time that Peter, at least one time that Peter 
opened his mouth and got his feet out of the way so he could tell the truth. And he did. He said, Thou, who do men say I am? Some say Elijah, some say the other prophets, some say this. He said, Well, who do you say that I am? And of course, Peter says, Thou art the Son of God. Thou art the Son of Christ. Son of God, the living Christ. Son of Christ. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. I'll get it right in just a minute. Uh, I, it's been one of those days when my, my tongue gets ahead of my brain, which is not very, not very hard to happen. And then she said, Ask the Lord, I do believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God, which should come into the world. And when she had so said, she went away and called Mary, her sister, secretly, where the other people couldn't hear. And because, remember, these were Jews that were there the most for the most part. And so were Mary and Martha and Lazarus. They were Jews. They were believing Jews. The Master is come and calleth for thee. Aren't those beautiful words? Apparently, Jesus had sent her back to get Mary. Because she says so here. Is Jesus is here, Mary. Now, I, I wasn't there, and it doesn't say exactly. But uh, I like this verse because it, it kind of strengthens my thinking. As soon as she heard this, what happened? She arose quickly. She got up and got out of there in her. I, wouldn't you, if you heard that Jesus had called for you? And I don't know, but I have a feeling if anybody was in her way, they kind of might have gotten bruised a little bit. And she was getting out of there, going to Jesus, and said, and ca she arose quickly and came unto him. Listen, I wish to God that we were all that responsive when he calls for us to go do something, do this, listen to me. Uh, this is something I want you to do. And by the way, you do know that God still speaks, don't you? You know that he, he reminds us of this word. The Spirit of God bears witness with, his, with, with our spirit that we're to do this, we're to do that. And, of course, the Spirit of God will never tell you anything that's inconsistent with this book. If someone tells you the Spirit of God told them something that's not consistent with this book, you tell them they're talking about the wrong spirit. And so he has called Mary. Mary comes quickly. And then Jesus, verse 30 says, Now Jesus was not yet come into the town, but was still at the place where Martha met him. He was still out and out away from where the main congregate was. The congregate was there at the house of, of Mary and Martha and Lazarus' house. Verse 31. The Jews then, which were with her in the house and comforted her, when they saw that Mary saw Mary, that she rose up hastily, another impression, and went out, followed her, saying, She goeth unto the grave to weep there. Amazing. Uh, supposition. Wrong. She was going not to weep for her brother. She was going to meet her Savior. And because he had called her. Verse 32. Then when Mary was come, where Jesus was, Look at this. Isn't this a beautiful statement? And saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying unto him the first word out of her mouth, Lord, did you see that? Did you notice um, that Martha said the very same thing in verse 21? Lord, they weren't blaming him for Lazarus' death. They were just reminding themselves that God was in control of this issue. That de death is not outside of God's control. You understand? Someone said that to me the other day, and I know it was just a statement, but said, well, you know, so-and-so died, and he just died so untimely. And, you know, I wanted to say something, but I, I felt that I didn't want to offend anyone. And I, I wanted to say, no, no, no. They were a believer. They died right on time. There's no such thing of a Christian dying early or late. It's right on time. It's hard for us to glean that, especially sometime when you see in some of the most difficult funerals I've ever done as children. I have the hardest time in the world doing that. And, and yet I know they, weren't, they never are ours. They're on loan from heaven, as someone has well said. And they're in God. They belong to God. They're God's. And uh, so is so are the rest of our people. And, and she fell at his feet saying, Lord, if thou hast been here, my brother had not died. And when Jesus therefore saw her weeping, and the Jews also weeping which came with her, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. Now, I had a wrong interpretation of this verse because of one word. When I read the word groaned, I think of, um, I think of sadness maybe. 
What do you, you think of that when you, and you look at this? Well, I found out, I did another word study here. I went back to the, to the, to the word, to the Greek. And you don't have to know Greek to understand uh, the context. But here's what caught me. It says, he groaned in the spirit and was what? Troubled. That's what made me go looking. I said, wait a minute, what, what, what does that mean? The word groaned, everywhere it's used, that word means angry, troubled, not just, not just sad. And I was trying to think, well, what? and here's the problem. What they were doing, they were weeping over someone's dead. As believers, do you understand? He already told his, 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 uh, his disciples that, that death was something that couldn't hold a believer because we never die. And I think that his, 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 ups, his upsetness, is that a word? It is now, right? I just made it up. I think he was bothered by the fact that they didn't believe what he had already taught them about the resurrection. And I believe that that's maybe what upset him. And, and, real, and that word, and by the way, check it out sometimes. Go get your, uh, get your lexicon and go look it up. And I think you'll find that that's what it means. And in verse 34, and said, where have you laid him? Jesus said, where have you laid him? And they said unto him, Lord, come and see. And then that verse is sitting here, Jesus wept. Why? Why? In the midst of all of this with Jesus. And by the way, here's another unusual thing. Looking at that word wept, it literally means a silent. It does, it, there's no hysteria here. It's just like a silent bursting forth of tears. Uh, nothing but just the weeping. Um, no noise that is like like the mourners do when they mourn a death. And, of course, we know that he wasn't mourning Lazarus. He was about to resurrect him. We know better. And some say, well, well maybe he was, um, he was mourning over the, the, the condition of those around him that didn't believe in the resurrection. I think that has some merit. But I also believe that his heart was broken for Mary and Martha, and because he loved Lazarus, but he knew that they loved him, and I believe he entered into their sorrows with them, but wondering why they didn't understand that this body that lays down is a temporary thing, and it's not even a separation from God. All it is is a change is going on, and we can't see it, but God and the person that's dead can because there never, there's never any separation. For a believer, when we die, there's no separation from God. We're separated from people, but not from God. And I think that he was seeing that, and it could be either one of those two possibilities, but in my mind, I've always seen it as him entering into their sorrows and, and weeping with them. And it's the only place in Scripture that we have any indication except where he wept over Jerusalem uh, of course, the condition that she's in. Verse 36, Then said the Jews, Behold how he loved him. And he did love him. And by the way, they used the same word. They used the word phileo here. Uh, they, he loved his friend. And some of them said, Could not this man, which opened the eyes of the blind, have caused that even this man should not have died? What do you think? Could he? Well, not only could he, he did. He had an object lesson going on that his father had prepared before the foundations of the world to prove to those around him that this was his son, in fact, him in the flesh, that had, the, had power over life and death. Listen to me carefully. I, there's nothing easy about losing someone you love in death. I don't care who you are. There's a very difficult set of circumstances. And, and how many, you know, the Bible says that we need to rejoice when they die and weep when they're born. And I, when you read that, you think, well, that's plum contrary. And I do believe that, that weeping when someone dies is very natural. I don't, let me put it this way. I believe we ought to be able to have a spiritual joy and an earthly sorrow at the same time. You lose somebody you love, you're going to be heartbroken. But if they know Jesus Christ, there's something in your spirit that says, Hallelujah, I'll see them before long. Amen. Won't be long. We're going to stop there. Anybody have any questions about all of the things that we've dealt with? Everybody got it down, Pat? Well, I had a lot of ifs in there. 
And I hope you, I challenged you enough to get you to want to go back and read some of that and even maybe pick up a lexicon and look at some of the wording so you maybe give you a better understanding of some of it, okay? 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 Mm hmm It went into the cities, that's what. <laughs> okay, well, I believe that. Yeah, what, are they still alive? Are they still, yeah, I, that, a valid question. <laughs> yeah, well, it, it's a reasonable question, at least in my mind, but from, from what I can understand, of course, they, oh, I believe when Jesus was resurrected, they might have been temporarily on this walking on this earth, but I believe eventually they went home with him at the same time because they already had their new bodies. They couldn't have been walking around in their old bodies because the old body was already decomposed. I think that's the answer I gave you and would be the answer that I have. And by the way, I, have, I, ask, I, ask a theolog I ask one of my professors that same question, and you know what he said? This is a, this is a standard answer. Uh, why don't you study and find out? I wonder sometime if they didn't say that because they didn't know. And I, 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 don't, I did not find anything to give me verification of what I just answered. But I do believe this. I believe certainly they could not, they could not die again. You only die once physically. So they couldn't have been in their physical bodies because that would have died. So they had, their bodies had to be changed. So I believe when Jesus was resurrected, they went into the cities bearing witness of Jesus Christ. And then he took them home his way. So, I don't know. And by the way, that's just my idea. <laughs> I don't have any other answers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Captive. Took captivity captive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think I think there's no I don't think there's a rapture there necessarily. I do think there's a catching up. Yeah, I think the point that when he when it says he lives captivity captive, we do know that he went into the lower parts of the earth and he preached to those held in held in prison. The Bible says uh, makes that plain. And the preaching there was a proclamation of of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I don't believe anybody was saved there. Uh, below the I think he was actually just fulfilling fulfilling the the scriptures and. And captivity was, uh, was what sin does. Sin holds us captive. So what he did by his resurrection, he led captivity captive so that we are no longer, remember Paul says in Romans chapter 6, that we are now no more slaves to sin. Captivity has been, we're not held captive to sin anymore. We sin because we want to. Jesus took care of that. Amen. Amen. Mm hmm. Yes. No, ma'am, they went to a place called paradise. It's almost like a holding place for the soul, if you want to look. Remember, the rich man died, and in hell he lifted up his eyes, and then Abraham, uh, the Bible says that they, the, the poor man uh, was taken into Abraham's bosom, which is a place called paradise. In fact, it was it was below. That's one of the things. How many ever saw that? Um, I was thinking of the film that was made years ago. Um, I guess it was The Burning Hell. I can't remember where they were showing a resurrection of a person before before there was a resurrection, showing his spirit going up. Um, anything before the spirit of God descending and opening up uh, the uh, resurrection possibility, Jesus was the first fruits of the resurrection. So we know that nobody ever had a resurrection until after Jesus did as far as a resurrection. So, but when Jesus led captivity captive, he emptied, he emptied paradise. Paradise has been emptied, and hell's been enlarged. I always wonder about that. But anyway, uh, so if I make, make sense, the bodies. Yeah, I believe every spirit 
goes home. See, there's only going to be one church. It's not going to be divided when we get to glory. There's not going to be Jews over here and Gentiles over here. It's going to be one church, and that church is going to be made up of anybody that trusted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And by the way, every person in the Old Testament was saved by the blood looking forward to the day of, of Christ's coming. And their salvation is just as real as ours. Uh, it was they're saved by that blood sacrifice. And we look back to the cross, and they look forward to the cross. But the salvation is both. No one was ever saved by the law. It wasn't intended for people to be used to save people. Saved by grace. Noah found grace in the eyes of God. I hope I answered your question. Anyone else? By the way, there's a lot of questions about what's going to happen when we go here and get there and go there. I had somebody today ask me, you know, I've always said that heaven's going to be a boring place. I said, well, you've got the wrong idea. Nothing going to be boring about heaven. That's going to be the most exciting place it's ever been. And I can't hardly wait to get there to show you how right I was. 